Before the financial crisis, financial stability seems like something that was really important, but not something that people worried enough about. Uh, we learned our lesson. And even though it's uh, been almost a decade since the onset of the financial crisis, and perhaps some people, perhaps even some in power in the United States are ready to roll back regulations, say we don't have to worry about financial stability anymore, uh, we're not convinced here. Uh, so uh, the order of business this morning is that Tobias is going to give a short presentation, and I'm going to be joined by a panel of people who have very different perspectives on these issues. I'll introduce them later, and then we'll have time for questions. Everybody should know that we're webcasting this, so if you fall asleep or use your phone, you might see it on C-SPAN tomorrow <laughs> at 3 a.m., so be careful. Uh, Tobias Adrian uh, came to the IMF recently after a distinguished career at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he was a senior vice president. Uh, he's, got, he's been worrying about these issues before I realized they were important. So uh, with that, I turn it over to you, Tobias. Good morning. Thanks very much uh, for having me at Brookings. Um, I'm going to talk about the Global Financial Stability Report, which was uh, released last week. And um, the title of the report this time is Getting the Policy Mix Right, uh, as we feel that financial stability is very tightly linked to the policy process. So uh, I brought a couple of slides just to illustrate uh, the main themes of the report. The good news is that global financial stability has improved in our view. Uh, the underlying economic growth momentum is stronger. Uh, the world economic outlook is explaining that in great depth. Uh, so growth is, is growing and the outlook for growth is, is, is positive. Uh, and furthermore, risk appetite has improved in financial markets. So financing conditions or broader financial conditions are favorable. And that's not just in advanced economies, but also in emerging markets. However, uh, there is downside risk. And um, uh, the downside risk uh, that we see is primarily related to policy uncertainty. Um, so there's a, there's a very big wedge at the moment in between the evolution of policy uncertainty and the evolution of market uncertainty. When you look, for example, at measures like the VIX, the uh, Equity Implied Volatility Index, that is at very low levels by historical standards. It has come up a little bit recently, but it's still you know, way below its, its average value. On the other hand, when you look at policy uncertainty, that has really spiked over the past six, uh, six to 12 months. So there's a big di disconnect in between the volatility that is priced into markets and policy uncertainty measures. Now, why is policy uncertainty so high? Uh, we see two particular downside risks. So one downside risk is the risk of global fragmentation or uh, a, 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 a resurgence or surgence of inward-looking policies. Uh, as you know, um, you know, the policy debate has shifted around the globe. And uh, the kind of values that the IMF is standing for, including global trade and multilateralism, have been questioned uh, recently in the political process. And so there is a risk of, of global fragmentation and, and protectionism. Secondly, uh, we worry about uh, financial conditions. Uh, so we worry that there might be a sharp tightening of financial conditions. We have seen... Uh, very, uh, very uh, much risk appetite that has increased. Credit spreads have tightened. Valuations in equity markets are very high. Equity volatility is very compressed. And when you see these kinds of very benign conditions in financial markets, there's always a risk of a sharp reversal. And that uh, could be triggered, for example, by expansionary fiscal policies, fiscal deficits that are increasing. Uh, or it could be triggered by other, uh, other policy developments. So let me talk about uh, three regions in particular. I'm going to start with the U.S., then talk about emerging markets, and finally about Europe. So in the, U in the U.S., the key question that we're asking is whether policies that are priced into markets at the moment are going to translate into what we call economic risk-taking, i.e., are economic policies such as um, uh, the corporate tax reform, uh, 
um, or the repatriation of, of, uh, of foreign earnings, uh, are those kind of reforms going to translate into more investment, into more corporate investment? What you can see on the left-hand side is that in the U.S., the, the share of capital expenditures uh, in total assets of the corporate sector has plummeted from roughly 6% to a level of only 4% at the moment. Um, so the 6% really uh, lasted from the early 1980s uh, until the early 2000s. And then in, in the 2001 recession, investment plummeted and really hasn't recovered since. So if, if the market is pricing in sustained economic growth going forward, so like a much higher growth rate, uh, then that would have to be based on much higher uh, corporate investment. Uh, and, and the question that we're asking, is it possible uh, for policies to translate into this uh, kind of sustained higher investment level? And uh, the, the kind of uh, fragility here is that uh, the corporate sector is already highly levered. Uh, so on the right-hand chart here, you can see that by historical ch standards, uh, corporate leverage in the U.S. is high. Um, so, of course, the corporate sector is healthy at the moment. But, but there are two, two kind of issues here. So one issue is that the corporate tax cuts and other structural policies that are aimed at the supply side of the economy, those might not necessarily translate into higher investment expenditure. They could translate into higher payouts, into higher equity payouts. And this is what we have seen since the global financial crisis when corporate investment really has, has not rebounded and instead the payouts to shareholders has increased very strongly. So, in fact, this run-up in, in leverage, much of that has been paid out to shareholders. Uh, and then, of course, a second risk is that uh, if financial conditions do deteriorate, if credit spreads were to widen, uh, bond market, uh, equity market valuations were to fall, then this uh, high leverage uh, could uh, generate fragilities in the corporate sector. Let me turn to emerging markets. So if there are these risks that materialize in advanced economies, the potential risks of global fragmentation or the potential risks of tighter financial conditions, that would spill over into emerging markets. The left-hand chart shows you uh, sensitivities of the corporate sector in a number of emerging markets to these two types of scenarios, a rise in protectionism and a rise in global risk premia. And you can see that different countries have different degrees of sensitivities to these risk events. So for example, China is particularly exposed to the risk of a rise in, in protectionism, while Brazil is particularly exposed to the risks of a rise in global risk premia. These external vulnerabilities then interact with domestic vulnerabilities in those sectors. Uh, for example, in the banking sector, in emerging markets, the share of problem loans as a, as a fraction of total loans has been increasing in recent years. Uh, so they have gone from 4.5% to over 6% since 2013. And as a result, the problem loan coverage ratio i.e. the degree to which the capital in the bank system would be covering those problem loans, has declined from uh, 100% on average across emerging markets to less than 70% most recently. Of course, one, uh, you know, the biggest emerging market uh, country uh, is China. China has contributed enormously to, to growth uh, of the global economy. Uh, but a lot of the growth since the financial crisis has been fueled by expanding credit. So the ratio of credit to GDP, the ratio of total credit in the Chinese economy to the size of the economy in terms of income, so the credit to GDP ratio, has increased from roughly 100% at the end of the financial crisis in 2000, or in the financial crisis in 2008, 
to over 200% more recently. Okay? So credit to GDP went from 100 to over 200% in less than 10 years in China. And historically, when you look across countries, this type of very fast rise in credit to GDP to a very high level is dangerous. So uh, these kind of developments typically precede some sort of adjustment. Uh, credit to GDP is a ratio that cannot grow forever. It has to slow down at some point. And the question is, at what point is this going to slow down? So let me move finally to the euro area. Uh, in the euro area, we look at the banking sector. Um, of course, capitalization in the banking sector has improved dramatically in the euro area since the global financial crisis. Uh, regulatory reforms such as Basel III have been implemented in Europe uh, to a large extent. And a lot of the, the hangover from the financial crisis has been cleaned up in many of the countries. But uh, Europe um, uh, is exposed to the very low yield environment, and that's very bad for bank profitability. And the yield, low yields are exposing structural weaknesses in the banking system. So the left chart is pointing out one of these weaknesses, so uh, the left chart, uh, the left bar on the left chart shows you um, return on equity, ROE, uh, for the total banking sector in Europe, uh, broken down into buckets below 8%, between 8 and 10%, and above 10%. And roughly half of the banks in Europe have fairly low return on equity. But then when you look at domestically focused banks, so that's the, the second chart, the, the second bar, three quarters of domestically focused banks have low return on equity, have a return on equity below 8%. And so, so it's really the domestically focused banking sector that has uh, structural weaknesses. So what is leading to low return on equity? So, so you can imagine that banks have a return on assets, and the difference between return on assets and return on equity is due to leverage. So, so part of the decline in return on equity is very mechanical due to the fact that the banking system is now better capitalized. For a given return on assets, you have lower return on equity, and that's in some sense a desired outcome of the regulations. However, return on assets is also determined by fundamentals of the banking sector, in particular, the amount of revenue, uh, the costs, and the amount of loan provisions. And different European countries have challenges along different dimensions. So, you know, some countries are perfectly healthy, while other countries have a challenge along some dimensions, and some countries are challenged along all three of these dimensions. So um, revenue pressure comes primarily from overbanking. Uh, cost pressures come primarily from inefficiencies in operations. And the high loan loss provisions in some countries are really a debt overhang uh, from the financial crisis. And so again, some countries have, have, have uh, uh, made tremendous progress. Uh, while others uh, have some of these structural challenges to address. So let me conclude so that we have time for discussion. Um, the key to financial stability uh, at this time is to get the policy mix right. I've uh, talked about three particular vulnerabilities. In the US, uh, the key message is for policymakers to guard against financial stability risks from rising corporate leverage. So uh, uh, the tax reforms and other proposed structural reforms really have to aim at uh, increasing corporate investment by taking the high leverage of the system into account. For emerging markets, uh, the key is to build resilience of banks and corporates because external vulnerabilities are interacting with domestic vulnerabilities. So as uh, global financial conditions and global trade is fluctuating around, uh, these emerging markets can become fragile due to their domestic fragilities. Uh, 
And then in Europe, uh, the key challenge is really to address structural weaknesses in the banking system. Now, I haven't talked much yet uh, about uh, regulatory reforms, but of course, underlying all of, the, all of global financial stability is the financial regulatory reform agenda, and the IMF is a strong proponent of the regulatory reform efforts that have been undertaken since the financial crisis and of the multilateral cooperation among countries and among agencies uh, in the Basel process. So thanks very much. I'm going to have the panel come up and sit wherever you like. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Um, I appreciate presenters who actually remember to look at their watch. So it was, I noticed you checked several times. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm very pleased that we have a panel of people who come at this from this important issue from a number of different places. Uh, I, sh I want to say that I'm standing here not be in order to assert some sort of dominance over the panel, but as you can see, we're kind of limited on space, so uh, it was only for that. Um, next to Tobias is Brahima Koulibaly, who is uh, new to Brookings. Uh, he's a senior fellow in our uh, Global Economy and Development Program, a co-sponsor of this event, and director of the Africa Growth Initiative here. Uh, he comes to us, and we're very happy to have him after 13 years at the Federal Reserve, where uh, the Board of Governors here in Washington, where he was most recently Chief of the Emerging Markets Branch. Uh, next to him is Deanna Farrell. Uh, Deanna is now head of the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, which is doing interesting work, taking advantage of all the data that J.P. Morgan has on, uh, on how the co consumers and businesses work. Uh, I should note, I'm asked to note that uh, J.P. Morgan itself is a donor to Brookings, uh, but actually had nothing to do with this event, but we always like to disclose that when it happens, and we appreciate their support. Uh, Deanna has in the past worked at the McKinsey Global Institute and was in the White House National Economic Council during that calm period uh, immediately after President Obama's election when we really saw what financial instability was. Um, I guess it's kind of a relief that if, I wonder, Diana, if in if this day in 2008, whether you thought we'd be discussing whether there's too much optimism in the financial system, and that was a downside risk. Uh, next to her is Robert Kahn, who's at the Council on Foreign Relations, who has been, among other things, with uh, more capital management, has worked at the fund and at the Federal Reserve. And finally, I'm pleased to be joined by Daniel Heller, who is visiting at the Peterson Institute for International Economics across the street. Uh, before that, he was the head of financial stability at the Swiss National Bank and has been involved in these issues for a long time. So, uh, Diana, maybe I can start with you. Um, so if you read the Global Financial Stability Report and you look at that nice spider chart they have, it looks like uh, everybody's very optimistic, uh, even though there seems to be a lot of downside risk, both in the, in the narrow senses that Tobias outlined, but also in the rather unusual political environment we find ourselves. So is, does this make sense, this market optimism at, in this context? Well, let me... uh, thank you, Dave, for the introduction and everyone for being here. Um, I, I'll start with uh, where you left off, which if um, just under 10 years ago when we were watching the system spin out of control, we could have envisioned me sitting at a Brookings uh, Hutchins event uh, in the calm state that we find ourselves in today, I think we would have thought of ourselves as very lucky. So I, I will say that. Um, and Tobias, thank you for your work on this. I thought this was a good report. I, I do worry a little bit about the optimism, if I, if I um, can sort of tie a couple of dots together. Um, there are many things that you point out to correctly that have improved, but it seems to me that a significant amount of the optimism is linked to market perception. Uh, you noted that risk appetite is sort of one of the um, potential upswings in this. And uh, one of the really impressive um, charts you have here, too, is uh, what has happened to the U.S. equity markets in, since particularly the election. And I think we all have to ask ourselves a very important question. 
Has anything changed so dramatically in the six months that we could really justify the equity rally we've seen and kind of the underlying shift in risk appetite? And, um, and I think you correctly say, well, the thing that has changed is the promise of a potentially different policy environment, one friendlier to business. Um, but I think that is premised on one very significant tax reform. And I think who would have thought tax would be so difficult? Who would have thought <laughs> healthcare would be so difficult? Not clear that we have uh, a team in place that knows how to navigate big, complicated bills. And it's not as though tax reform isn't one of the most difficult things you could possibly try to tackle. Every administration that I've ever read about has tried, and only a few have succeeded in doing that. Um, and, and, and the regulatory issues, and I do think that it's fair to say that um, we already see at the EPA and many other agencies where executive action is more powerful, probably a f business friendlier environment for um, investment and action. Uh, but let us remember that it was that kind of lax regulatory oversight that might have given us pretty healthy growth in parts <coughs> of the pre-crisis period, but sowed the foundation for like a very profound instability that followed. Uh, so so I, I, I do worry that we are relying, the optimism that you report here is relying too much on either something that is unlikely to happen or could happen in a nefarious way that would undermine uh, stability in the long run. Um, so let me just start with that. And, and the question would be, is that fair, and how would you respond to that? Tobias, uh, I think I'll let you respond, because otherwise we'll end up, no? do you want to go through the whole panel first? Okay, all right. Brahima, uh, one of the things that Diana mentioned was that uh, the world changed after 2008, and I'm curious what you think has been the lasting effect of those changes on the emerging markets that uh, part of which to be as highlighted in his presentation. Uh, yeah, first, uh, let me start out by congratulating Tobias on this report. Uh, I very much enjoyed reading it. I thought the choice of the, the topic were really great and uh, uh, the key messages were uh, spot on. Pull, pull the mic a little closer to you. As I look at the emerging market landscape say, since the global financial crisis, Actually, what strikes me the most is, in fact, how resilient they have been. Um, starting first with the global financial crisis itself, and then you had uh, uh, the European crisis in late 2011, that followed by the taper tantrum, and then the commodity price shock in 2014, and then the Chinese stock market crash and exchange rate devaluation in 2015. So those were a series of really major shocks that would have, in, in other times, say in the 90s, cause uh, widespread systemic crisis in emerging markets. But what we've observed by and large is that they've been able to weather those uh, shocks uh, relatively well uh, to various degrees. Uh, not to say they came out on scarf, but at least uh, we didn't see them uh, lining up to get bailouts from the IMF. So they have done something right. And uh, what that thing is, in my view, is that they have moved to strengthen a lot their fundamentals. They have reduced a lot vulnerabilities. And uh, importantly, they've uh, bolstered policy credibility and switched to flexible exchange rate uh, regime, which has given them some room to be able to use a bit more effectively their domestic policies. Uh, that being said, obviously past resilience is no guarantee for future resilience, especially now that they're in an environment of what I believe would be uh, relatively low growth, uh, coupled with uh, relatively limited uh, policy space. So in this kind of environment, then I think uh, a difference between a growth rate of 2% uh, and 1% may very well feel like 50% uh, as opposed to 1%. And uh, uh, it would have been uh, uh, nice to be able to see um, some stress tests along those dimensions as to what will happen, say, if growth, the forecast in the wheel sort of under delivers. And uh, in part because uh, since 2011, uh, the, the wheel has been, forecast has been, has surprised consistently on the downside in various vintages. And that is not a criticism of our fund colleagues. I think it's a reflection of how we approach forecasts as macroeconomists. And uh, I do think uh, that uh, being, that is intimately sort of linked to uh, corporate earnings and as well as uh, perhaps uh, <coughs> uh, debt at risk. So it would have been good to be able to kind of provide some scenarios where you shock growth and then we see 
then what, uh, uh, how many uh, emerging market uh, firms are able to, to survive and whether this could indeed uh, turn into a much bigger problem. Rahima, what happens if the dollar is very strong and emerging market corporates have borrowed a lot in dollars? Is that a risk that I should worry about or do you think that's one that's overplayed? I think that is uh, um, a, a risk certainly to, to worry about. And uh, if you go back to, I think, the 90s and earlier part of 2000, it was one of the perennial uh, problems that emerging markets indeed had. So what the stronger dollar does in, is uh, basically weakening the emerging markets' currencies. And uh, to the extent that they have some liabilities not fully matched by uh, dollar assets, then it sort of boosts a little bit their debt servicing costs. And that in, that in turn can indeed create problems for them. I think it is part of the issue that vulnerability they've reduced, the ones I alluded to earlier. Um, but since the global financial crisis, uh, dollar debt has been again on the rise. And uh, just last week, I read uh, a report uh, on the Q1 uh, 2017 that it was the highest issue, about $100 billion of issuance, which was the highest in any first quarter. And uh, uh, but that is not to say that they have exposures. Uh, we need to go back and then be able to see whether they are sufficiently hedged, either naturally or through the financial uh, system. And unfortunately, it's where I think, too, there's some data gaps that don't allow us to be able to assess the extent of the exposure. And uh, those working on uh, those financial stability issues, including the fund and the BIS, that would be a good uh, uh, place to try to fill in those data gaps. Hmm. Interesting. Daniel, uh, do you share Tobias's anxieties about the perennial problems of the European banking system? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, I have, uh, before I get into the substance, I have to say that uh, I have read, uh, I think, uh, two dozens of GFSRs before the crisis, and it has always been a uh, very informative, including the last one. I think if there were no GFSRs, one had to uh, invent them. So now on European banks, I, I broadly share uh, the IMF's conclusions. European banks uh, are a diverse group. You have uh, banks that are in the, the Euro area. You have banks that are in the European Union. You have banks that are not in the European Union and not in, in the Euro, Euro area. You have small banks, big big banks, so it's very hard to, to come up with a, generalized, uh, with a generalized assessment. But I would say in general, the situation has improved. Supervision of Euro area, uh, large Euro, Euro area banks has improved through the uh, <coughs> single supervisory mechanism. Capital levels have uh, also increased uh, I would uh, share the assessment that there is overbanking. There is too much. There are too many banks with uh, too many branches. There are operational uh, inefficiencies stemming from underinvestment uh, in technology. But I would also add, I think, uh, that uh, capital levels are still not where, where they should be. There is still not, not enough capital, and this is a problem because weak banks don't lend. Only banks with enough capital are able to take risk and lend to the, to the private sector. And I think that's one of the, the problems of the euro area, that there's not enough credit, and that's because the banks don't have enough capital. Uh, Maybe an additional thought that I would like to offer is that if we want to understand the problems of the euro area banks, we also have to look at the governance stru structure. And there, I think we see that uh, many euro area banks have governance issues that they have to address. And let me illustrate this with the comparison of, of euro area banks with Anglo-Saxon banks. In, in the UK, in, in the US, Canada, and Australia. And what we find, for instance, is that uh, fewer euro area, large euro area banks are listed at stock exchanges. Only about two thirds in terms of assets are listed uh, on stock exchanges compared to basically 100% in Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. This means uh, there's less transparency in euro area banks. There's less 
market discipline, and this ultimately is an explanation for the, the, the balance sheet problems, the NPL problems. And if you look at the ownership structure, uh, we also see that large euro area banks, they have much less dispersed ownership. Uh, less than half of euro area banks have dispersed ownership compared to about 90% of Anglo-Saxon banks. And this implies that uh, it's much more difficult for these banks to raise capital because you will have a, a large shareholder that don't likes to be diluted. Thank you. I should have noted, and I, I meant to, that uh, uh, although uh, Daniel was the head of financial stability at Swiss National Bank, his most recent job was right as an executive director at the fund for Switzerland and a, a great collection of countries, Switzerland, Poland, Serbia, Azerbaijan, and what were the four Central Asian? Do you remember them? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan. So. Very good. So, Rob, um, on one hand, I'm taught everything has changed since the global financial crisis. On the other hand, there's this uh, fascinating observation, and, and the world is more global. I mean, I read in the paper today that a Chinese conglomerate has now the largest shareholder in Deutsche Bank. Uh, uh, Diana's outfit has, has forecast, uh, has talked a lot, the, the old the McKinsey Global Institute talked a lot about the financial connections across countries. Yet the GFSR says that, well, you know, somewhere between 20 and 40% of the uh, variation in, among countries can be explained by global financial conditions, but the bulk is still domestic. And even more interesting and surprising to me, the fraction that's global has not increased in the last 20 years. You buy this? Uh, well, I, my basic presumption is to buy whatever's in the report. Uh, <laughs> that's it's no great, fun. It's a great Gosh. report. I always rely on it. I learn from it. And it has become so important that it does set the, cons the, the starting point of international debates. But I think, David, you've, you've hit on the thing I struggled with the most as I read the report. Because certainly my presumption coming in is exactly as you said it. And let's use the US as an example. Following the global financial crisis, we've lost confidence in a lot of the critical economic relationships that guided our understanding, both in terms of how the economy responded to shocks and the role of monetary and financial policies, the Phillips curve, the beverage curve, the role of international factors, and they did and did it. And we have struggled, right, and debated what it means for the U.S. economy, what it means for where long-term interest rates are going to go, and, and where, indeed, the economy is headed. Uh, and so certainly my presumption was, indeed, that things have changed in recent years, and that as we move forward, we do probably need to be paying a lot more attention to international factors and the role they play on the U.S. economy in terms of how shocks transmit and the like, uh, that we need some different models. Uh, maybe that's wrong. Maybe it's just that in some sense these relationships have been delayed by headwinds, by uh, the, the natural repair that needed to happen, and we're going to kind of be back to these, these relations are going to start manifesting themselves in coming <laughs> weeks or months. But it hasn't happened yet, and as long as it doesn't happen, we need to, we need to admit that uncertainty. Uh, from that perspective, I think the report, and particularly chapter three of the report, which is excellent, uh, presents a conundrum in this way. It, it does argue for globalization and more attention to global factors, but the evidence they present on this long-term limited change in the role of international factors seems to me cuts against this conventional wisdom. Uh, and, and, and it's very hard to know. It, I think it does feed into the broader question we're discussing today, which is the role of extended policy uncertainty for markets and for financial stability more broadly. But if I, the world has enjoyed or suffered, depending on your perspective, very low interest rates in the United States for a very long time with some degree of uncertainty about how fast they were going to rise, but I think that uncertainty has dissipated some. They're going up. Okay. So do you think the, and the report mentions this, do you think the system is vulnerable to strains that will occur when the biggest central bank in the world starts to raise interest rates could be another 50 basis points this year. They could stop, uh, increase, they could start shrinking the balance sheet, yeah. might be a few more basis points next year. How big a risk is that, do you I think? I think it's a pretty significant risk uh, going forward. Part, as you say, a lot of it is the monetary 
conditions point that we seem to be seeing a, a different Fed right now in terms of its willingness to move uh, aggressively in tightening financial conditions, both through rate hikes and through, uh, at some point, an announcement of a change in how they're going to handle uh, the assets on their balance sheet. Uh, that's certainly part of it. Uh, and Brahima talked about the, our long history of that having potentially, those type of cycles having profound effects uh, on global markets. Uh, where we go, once again, another element of policy uncertainty, the board of the Federal Reserve System will look very different in about a year, five, potentially maybe six changes. Uh, and so we don't really, we have this additional uncertainty that the policy views of the, the key players may be very different in a year. Uh, so yes, I do think that that is a significant uh, continuing risk in terms of the policy. And if I can kind of just broaden it out uh, and tie it back into some of the earlier comments. The, the broader question here is that, to my mind, is the market, the market's resilience to this extraordinary range of monetary and geopolitical risks that we face. Now, at one level, we shouldn't be shocked. Uh, Jens Niestead, Morgan Stanley, and I went back and just looked at a, a long, the long history of political shocks since World War II. And what we found was that uh, actually in the majority of cases, markets, while they often fell quickly after a big shock, bounce back very quickly as well. Uh, and often within a, a period of a week, we're back to where they started. So in some sense, this resilience that we've seen in the face of these uncertainties following things like the Brexit vote uh, or French elections and the like actually is more the norm than the exception. But when we pushed further and said, well, why is there this confidence despite all this economic and political uncertainty, we kept on coming back to the idea that it, markets had a strong, in cases where they were resilient, had this strong confidence in the policy framework. It goes back to Tobias's first slide. And this confidence that policymakers will do the right thing. Now, in some cases, that can be a monetary and fiscal response. In some cases, it's confidence that the key political leaders have the ideas, the wherewithal, the skills to respond in the right way. And of course, if anything challenges that, whether it's the people in power or this more broad wave of populist and nationalist sentiment, which I believe is going to continue to constrain policymakers going forward, then you know, that may call into question this fundamental anchor uh, in, the mar in market response, which comes from just basically saying policymakers can deal with whatever we face. So, Tobias, uh, can we start with the point that we made a couple times? The, the markets, emerging markets, have been impressively resilient through a series of post-crisis shocks. I sense a little bit of anxiety on the part of the panel that that, may, that period may be coming to an end. Do you share that anxiety? <clears throat> so we have been through a very long expansion since the financial crisis. Uh, the economic expansion has been um, uh, uh, seven years already. Uh, which is uh, much longer than the average expansion uh, since, since World War II. Uh, during that expansion, growth has been very low. Uh, globally, growth is low. Uh, and that is reflective in very low interest rates. Um, so, um, so central bank interest rates are low because we're in this low growth environment where demographic factors are changing, where productivity is lower. Uh, and uh, so we have been in a recovery, but it's a recovery with low growth. The turning point that was identified in the wheel is one uh, where it, it's, it's totally cor correct what Premier said. Uh, the IMF, along with uh, pretty much all other forecasters, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector, have consistently forecasted that we would get back to a higher growth equilibrium, right? So post-financial crisis, people every year would forecast, well, we are at 1.8% right now or 2% right now, but we'll get back to 3% next year and they were per persistently disappointed. What is a little bit different in the current environment than over the past seven years is that um, uh, there is sort of like evidence from around the world that we might be getting back to a slightly higher growth path. Um, and, and it's really 
it's really evidence that is not just located in one country, one region, but it's, it, it's sort of like broadly around the world. Now, is it dramatic? No, it's not very dramatic, but it, it feels like a little bit of a turning point, and that is exactly uh, how the uh, world economic outlook is, is, is presenting the story. Could we be disappointed? Yes, of course, we could be disappointed, and that's where the pol policy uncertainty is coming in. Um, you know, there are lots of risk factors out there. In terms of market pricing, uh, which is what both Diana and Robert has, has talked to, uh, basically with the, with the recovery, uh, we have seen equity markets rally. The, the rally has, has started since the end of the financial crisis. Since 2009, we have seen equity markets rally. And at the same time, we have seen, of course, interest rates continuing to go down globally. And so when you look at the equity risk premium, so when you look at equity market valuations taking into account that future cash flows are discounted with lower interest rates than they were historically, then, of course, the equity risk premium is starting to be somewhat compressed, but it's not extremely compressed by historical values, right? So basically, the... the the, say the price earnings ratio is very elevated, right? Price earnings is very elevated, but that's not taking into account that interest rates are low and interest rates are expected to be low for a long time in the future. So this is where uh, people often use the equity risk premium and the equity risk premium is compressing, but it's not extremely compressed by historical standards. So this is, this is one thing uh, that is important, but of course we are in the, in the late cycle um, and um, and there, there, there are risk factors out there, which is exactly what I was trying uh, to get at uh, in my presentation. Now, um, these risks are, are uh, the risks that we are seeing are, are a lot of uh, policy risks. Um, so, um, you know, Prahima was talking about emerging markets and we fully agree that emerging markets are exposed to these swings in global financial conditions. So we actually document that when you look at domestic financial conditions in countries around the world, 40% of those domestic financial conditions are associated with global financial conditions. Okay, so the extent to which domestic financial conditions vary, 40% of that comes from global developments. In contrast, only around 12% of domestic financial conditions is associated with domestic monetary policy shocks. So when, when sort of like global financial conditions vary around, you can offset them with domestic monetary policy, but on average, uh, in the data, um, you know, countries are not doing all that much uh, with monetary policy in terms of financial conditions. So the exposure of emerging markets to global financial conditions has improved since 2013, say. So the countries that were particularly exposed to the taper tantrum in 2013 are generally um, have, have increased their resilience uh, they have increased their foreign reserves. They have actually slightly reduced the U.S. dollar ex exposure. But uh, vulnerabilities remain. Um, and so just uh, coming to the European banks, so, so again, the, the key takeaway for Europe is that there's a variety of problems in different countries. Uh, for example, Italy uh, and, and Portugal are still struggling with the hangover of the financial crisis. Uh, they have a lot of non-performing loans. Um, and they're also struggling with overbanking and high, high costs. Other countries, uh, more in the north, you know, might not have the NPL problems, uh, but they, some of them do have uh, overbanking problems. Um, some of them actually only have the overbanking problem uh, they have very low costs, uh, but they have a lot of branches. So it's, you really have to look at different countries uh, have different problems uh, in Europe. I have a, a different question, but if anybody have a response or want to follow up on anything that to be said. So um, if I had been 
if I hadn't read the GFSR and I had to guess what they would say about the U.S. economy, I would not have expected to see U.S. corporate leverage as the one thing that's highlighted. Um, I recognize, and uh, Tobias had this nice chart about uh, leverage, um, and he nicely adjusted for energy. As I understand it, there is a lot of leverage in energy, which has obviously been a problem, giving low, uh, low oil prices. Um, and there are issues that the Fed has pointed out in uh, real estate. But my prior would have been that compared to where we were, like that's the last thing I'm worrying about, the stability of the industrial balance sheets. Um, uh, another, uh, this is the journalistic thing of you don't have data, use anecdotes. Um, uh, that Apple reported yesterday they have $250 billion of cash and the Wall Street Journal calculated that's enough to buy, that exceeds the market cap of 26 of the 30 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So did anybody share my uh, surprise that U.S. corporates are on the list? And, or do you agree or disagree with this, that as a highlight? Deanna? I would definitely agree that um, it, it surprised me. If, if anything, I would have thought of that more as a strength that would corroborate your more um, optimistic view of the U.S. economy, um, not only because the level of cash sitting not just at Apple, but at many, many corporates right now are sort of record highs, um, but also because it's, it's pretty clear that if we could, if somehow corporates do expand their appetite to invest more, there's a lot of supply to feed them. And so I think they could easily raise more, um, more capital, either debt or equity, and, and therefore would not need to um, rely on increased leverage to do it. If anything, I think there's a um, frustration in the investor markets that there isn't enough opportunity to invest in, in equity-like uh, returns. So I, I agree that that is not the biggest risk. I see the, the um, the bigger risk, as you correctly point out, kind of the policy uncertainty, uh, but in the U.S. context, um, in particular, uh, some of the um, the detrimental ways in which otherwise good things could turn out. Daniel? Yeah, I have to admit I was a little surprised too. Uh, I found it an interesting read, this chapter, but uh, I, it did not entirely convince me for the following reasons. So if if there is this corporate tax cut and incentives to repatriate money to the US, we we don't really know how much of this tax cut and repatriation will be invested. So obviously there will be some investments, but uh, in order to have leverage to, to increase, they would have to invest the amount of the tax cut and what they take back plus increase leverage. And for this to happen across the non-financial sector, I think it's, it's just, to me, not so, not so likely. In other words, they might get a tax cut, they might bring back some money, but that wouldn't necessarily lead to more leverage unless they invested it all and borrowed some more on top of it. Oh, they, yeah. they may buy back shares, right. they may right. increase wages, they may uh, increase dividends. We don't know that. So. Right. Of course, at the rate we're going, I, if I were a corporation, I wouldn't be spending my tax cut just yet. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of this gets to the view of where, about where your view about where the right button. The right button. A lot of this gets to your view about where we are in the cycle. Uh, certainly, I think there are a lot of commentators out there that worry that particularly uh, low-rated corporate credits are extraordinarily uh, rich for this stage of the cycle. Of course, then we debate where we are in the cycle. Uh, but I think it's a macro concern at the core. Uh, I kind of share the view. I, do, I think the legislative agenda uh, that we get out of this administration is quite limited. I assume tax reform will not get through. We'll probably end up with some, a more narrow set of cuts. But then at the end of the day, what it is, it's a fiscal, simple fiscal expansion at near full employment that the Fed will be forced to respond to and sh will likely create imbalances uh, and, you know, and spill over to probably bad investment decisions over time. And I think that has to be the fundamental concern. Now, if you're an optimist and you think, you know, we're going to have 3% growth, 
and that in a sense we're going to crowd in this uh, this additional spending with great new in, with great new investments. Uh, you can be pretty sanguine, but I think you know most mainstream economists, and certainly I align myself with the view that there's just not the space there for that. Actually, Rob, if I could just add one thing to that. Um, I think that's right. I think that where you could get slightly pessimistic here is to see this large fiscal stimulus that actually drives kind of more heat and, and mm -hmm. problems. And you, your report, I think, correctly says, look, the ri there is a risk that, um, that the regulatory reform agenda will weaken financial stability. But I would have – I wonder if you could talk to how much – of this, um, I think the biggest risk is around capital, liquidity, solvency uh, t type of provisions that the Dodd-Frank uh, put in place that more of the G20 are sort of adopting. Um, we didn't get too much of that in this report. I would argue that that may be more important than what interest rates are doing or not, although the report spent right. a lot of time talking right. about the interest rates. That was my next question. Oh, yeah. sorry. All right, so to be us, let's divide this in two pieces. One is the response on the corporate, then the second is, well, I'll get to the financial regulation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when you, when you think about the U.S. corporate sector, you really want to think about it not as one sector, but you want to cut it into in, in different dimensions, uh, looking at the cross-section of firms. And uh, what you correctly point out is that there are some firms in the U.S. corporate sector that have a tremendous amount of cash and have very low leverage. Uh, so Apple is a typical example. Tech companies in general tend to have a lot of cash and very low leverage. Uh, however, that is not the whole uh, corporate sector in the US. Uh, there are others, uh, other parts of the sector uh, that have less cash and more leverage. Um, and in particular, when you look at uh, the investments or so the capital expenditures of US corporates, uh, what you will find is that Roughly half of the corporates um, that, uh, so, sorry, half of the spending of, of capital expenditures of the U.S. corporate sector is done by only three sectors that uh, are extremely highly leveraged and where, or that is highly leveraged, and where uh, cash flow does not cover capital expenditures. So those are, you know, utilities, energy, and real estate. And so those sectors do produce half of capital expenditures. They do have high leverage, and they have low cash flows relative to capital expenditures. So if, if you want to, you know, if, if you want to generate a higher growth rate going forward through capital expenditure, the whole corporate sector has to expand. But this subsector of the corporate sector has to expand as well. And so that subsector would either have to take on more leverage or issue equity. So to the extent that capital that the equity market valuations continue to be rich, uh, probably that sector could issue equity, as Diana pointed out. Um, but the risk is, of course, that there's a reversal uh, to valuations, and at that point, that 50% of the sector that is highly leveraged, um, you know, becomes fragile, and it might this might not translate into the higher capital expenditures, uh, the policy as 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 uh, expected by some market participants. So that's the risk that we're seeing. Can I just follow up? On? Yep. So why? Sh I understand that most of the capital, half the capital investment has been in energy, uh, real estate, and utilities. I get that. That might be a bad thing. But why would I have to project that that will continue? Isn't, the, isn't there a possibility that that investment will not? We've overbuilt shopping centers. We've done the fracking thing so that the majority of capital spending, if we get a capital spending boom, will be on the other sectors of the economy, the industrial and the high tech and all that? That could be the case. I, I, for sure, I mean, the, the future of the economy could look very different than the past. But, you know, typically, structural changes in the economy, you know, compositional effects across sectors are very, very slow-moving uh, kind of things. So, I, I guess mean, I thought the anomaly was that the other sectors aren't investing rather than that these sectors were. But, no, they all, all of the sectors have cut back capital expenditures. 
so the first chart that I showed, uh, where you see the sharp drop in capital expenditures around is 2001, that is, that is fairly broad-based. Okay. And uh, so, you know, to, to really get to a sustained higher level of growth, you would expect to see higher capital expenditure across right. the economy. Okay. Can I ask, uh, before I get you to financial stability, I want to get, so Deanna raises a, a good question, and I don't think it's a, only a U.S. question. Um, it's easy to make the case that we are at the high point of financial regulation, that the combination of uh, Daniel leaving the uh, BIF, uh, Brexit, uh, the rise of the deregulators in the Trump administration, a change in personnel at the Federal Reserve, it's kind of hard, it's easy to make the case, I'm not sure it's right, that this is the high watermark. And what Deanna's saying is, be careful, because once you start down this slope, it tends to be pretty fast, and that's how we got into this mess. So do you share that concern, Rob? I do, and I think in some ways that would be the most direct challenge to the report, because the report, after laying out these concerns, the incomplete reform agenda, sort of basically says we need more, right? We need more Europe. We need... Uh, to move more aggressively on this global uh, reform agenda in which we back by international agreements and enforcement mechanisms and the like. But if you step back from that and say, you know, we, we are seeing a fundamental rewriting of our political debate, right? And these debates on open, an open view of the world, an integrated view versus a more closed nationalistic view is going to inform our politics and our economics probably for the next decade, nowhere more so than in the financial space, where I think a nationalist, whether in the US or in, in Europe or elsewhere, will come up, may agree with the, the concerns and come up with a completely different policy agenda for it. In the US context, you know, where I don't think we'll get legislation, but over the next three, five, seven years, we could be a, see a very significant change in the regulatory environment to something that could be more nationalistic. What does that include? Uh, does it mean ring fencing? Does it mean barriers to inward investment, uh, preferences for smaller national banks and the like? Uh, on the other hand, it could mean regulatory forbearance and laxity. We don't know, and that regulatory uncertainty hangs with us, but certainly at the core of it, that nationalist approach involves rejection of large multilateral right. agreements backed by binding sacrifice of sovereignty in the name of a greater good. And, and I think that, in some sense, is the core of the argument, is how we can we form a coalition for the kind of suggestions that are in, in, in this report. Rahim or Daniel, do you want to weigh in before I toss it back to Go ahead, Daniel. I think the spectrum of possible scenarios is just extremely big. Which you do and point then, out. And, and, yeah. and, and I think... Oh, yeah, definitely. What is in the report is, in a way, they try. One can see they try to come up with what we know possible are possible uh, scenarios, like corporate tax cut in in the U.S., some repatriation of money. They they say that uh, regulation may be weaker. They make a point it should not happen, but but of course, I mean, the, the world can fall apart. I, I fully. I do. I do think that the. One of these, I always feel like these reports, if something happens, they've got it covered. Like there was a sentence or a footnote that said, oh yeah, we mentioned that. So to be us, how serious a risk is it that we have a race to the bottom in financial regulation after this uh, sustained race to the top? Um, <clears throat> so of course the International Monetary Fund is, is uh, very much committed to global cooperation among the regulatory bodies. Um, we feel that this has served the member countries of the BIS and the world more broadly uh, to coordinate globally on minimum standards. Uh, one thing that is important to recognize is that, uh, say, the Basel III process is international cooperation, but, of course, every country can implement those standards in the way that it sees most useful uh, for its own country. So those, those are not binding agreements. So it's the regulators uh, that are convinced by the process 
that are going back to their home countries and then go through all of the processes uh, that are uh, you know, particular to their countries in terms of writing rules to implement those standards or, or passing laws to implement those standards. Um, so there's no sovereignty that is, that is giving up to, uh, to the international um, uh, uh, regulatory bodies. Um, so we are, at the, at the fund, we are fully committed to the high capital standards uh, and liquidity regulation as well as the resolution regime that has been developed since the financial crisis. We feel that this is really the core of the regulatory reforms. Uh, we are now in a system where banks are much more highly capitalized. Uh, the system is much more resilient as an effect. And, um, and the quality of capital has increased as well. Uh, similarly, liquidity standards have been introduced, which makes uh, the banking system a lot more resilient. And then the resolution regime really aims at dealing with uh, too big to fail issues uh, so that uh, large financial institutions can be resolved in a manner that does not create systemic risks. So those are the three main pillars of the international uh, regulatory reforms. Of course, in every jurisdiction around the world, there have been additional rules that have been implemented. Uh, and um, those uh, additional rules are not necessarily part of the Basel Agreement. Um, and, uh, you know, they, you know, they are not, uh, necessarily part of the, of the global consensus, and some of the additional rules might, um, might be streamlined. Uh, so even in the implementation of the Basel regime, there are, uh, there are lots of uh, degrees of freedom that regulators have, and uh, with the benefit of seeing how those regulations work, uh, you know, some of the regulations might be, uh, might be optimized without giving up uh, of the, these core principles, which is high capital, high liquidity, and the resolution regime. I compliment you on the diplomacy of that answer. Uh, Brahima, um, we haven't talked about China. Uh, the report makes the, uh, the obvious but uh, rather frightening observation that the Chinese have a real tension between, on one hand, they want to deleverage, on the other hand, they want to keep growth going. So um, I guess my, it occurs to me that if I were stepping back and looking at what are the two or three things that could really upset this apple cart, uh, that China blowing it would be one of them. So how do you think about China? Are, are we sufficiently concerned about China? But more importantly, is China sufficiently concerned about getting the balance right, do you think? <laughs> And you don't work at the Fed anymore, so you don't have to be diplomatic <laughs> like Tobias. No, I think there could never be enough uh, of a concern about conditions going on uh, in, in China. And in fact, uh, I think since uh, uh, the aftermath of the um, financial crisis, it's been uh, one uh, area basically on the radar of almost everybody looking at financial stability um, issues. And uh, with any flare-up, uh, it seems like most expecting then a crisis to unravel, but they've managed somehow to prove uh, uh, predict doom doomsayers wrong uh, every single time. How much longer that can go on is quite uncertain. I think, as the, you correctly point out, and the report touches on this, is indeed we, uh, the main vulnerability has been leverage. It's gone up by quite a bit, and I think the credit gap is uh, somewhere around 25 percentage point of GDP. Uh, which, in uh, any normal circumstance, would have resulted okay. in a crisis. define a credit gap? Uh, the, the credit gap would basically be the run-up in credit versus what you would consider a normal and healthy expansion of credit. Um, and uh, for, so then that's really a, a major concern. But China being China, there are some unique features of the economy uh, that may uh, suggest that uh, they have levers to mitigate the situation. Um, the first is that a lot of that debt is really um, owned by state-owned enterprises who owe to state-owned banks. So it's a sovereign owing to itself in some sense. Um, and uh, once you take that into account, uh, you may say that in the end they may should be able to somewhat use some of the resources at their disposals to, 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 to mitigate it. Uh, 
Um, and indeed, it's been growing because of that tension precisely. Uh, they're running a really delicate uh, balancing act between the need to really uh, preserve a minimum level of GDP growth so they don't run into a lot of unemployment situation that could in turn uh, result into social unrest. But at the same time, they recognize that the rising credits is a major issue. Uh, so what they've been able, what they've been doing so far, looks like uh, they take one step in addressing uh, the vulnerability, but then they watch the growth outcome. And if it looks like growth is going to slow, they will take a step back and then switch their attention to growth. Um, so what I'm most worried about is uh, that uh, I think they do have the resources to handle a, 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 a downfall from, for the, because of the reasons I mentioned. What I'm perhaps most worried about is the complexity of the task, given how opaque and interconnected it is, sort of overwhelms uh, their ability to react in a timely fashion. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I'd like to take a few questions, and I think what I'd like to do is take two or three. We'll start with you, Anders, and Peter, there's a question right next to you. Take two or three, and then we'll let the panel and the others respond. Thank you very much. I would like, Anders Oslund from the Atlantic Council. I would like to ask uh, about an apparent contradiction here in the panel. On the one hand, you want uh, the regulation that we have now, or even more. On the other hand, you want more globalization. We are now seeing that the European banks are withdrawing from Eastern Europe, not only from Russia and Ukraine, but also from Poland and uh, Hungary. And this is very much because of uh, European uh, bank regulation. We are seeing that American banks are withdrawing from emerging markets because it costs too much in terms of uh, compliance costs. And perhaps most pernicious of all is uh, FATCA, the Foreign Account uh, uh, Tax Compliance Act, which means that US persons barely can open a bank account in uh, Europe. Uh, what would you like to do about this? Thank you. Uh, Peter's one on your right. A uh, gentleman has a card on. And, and then Bert. Yes. So you are, please. Yes, Bert Kurlovsky, Voice Noise Foundation. Two very brief questions. In the quest for financial stability, how much inefficiency in the credit allocation to the real economy can you take? And the second question is on this re profits to be repatriated, I hear cash, cash, cash. What cash? Have these not been deployed? Might not these $2.2 trillion already be invested in treasury bills? Whatever. What cash are you talking about? Thank you. Uh, Bertie Lee, behind you, Peter, to the right. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Bert Ely, banking consultant. I have a, a, a two-part easy question about China. Uh, number one. Easy question about China. Right? Well, <laughs> um, to, to what extent... Uh, might there be an instance where the banking regulators will uh, lean on the banks, both state-owned and private, to start getting more realistic about reserving for uh, uh, the loan losses on their books? And uh, to what extent might we see a demand shock uh, in China if uh, not only businesses but households uh, start to become concerned about being over-leveraged and consequently cut back on their borrowing and therefore on final demand? Okay. Anybody want to volunteer for uh, Anders' question was basically are we having undesired effects of bank regulation. Looks like it's you caught the ball. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do first. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to start. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so we do see, we do see to some extent. Uh, that global banking is becoming less global. Um, <clears throat> and what you're pointing out is that regulations play a role there. But of course, there are other factors as well. Um, since the financial crisis, uh, you know, uh, bank business models have changed dramatically, not only due to regulations. Of course, the regulations play a big role but also due to the changing uh, economic environment. Uh, so for example, the European banks um, had uh, started large banking organizations, in particular trading organizations, in the US in the run-up to the crisis uh, you know, in order to increase returns. Um, and uh, once the financial crisis hit, many of those operations 
registered very large losses, and that is one of the factors that is making those banks reevaluate their uh, global uh, presence. Um, secondly, I mean, there are, there are attempts to ring fence, uh, and that is really a, a way of deglobalization. Uh, you know, uh, Switzerland was one of the first countries to, to ring fence. Um, the U.S. has uh, the intermediate, bank hol um, intermediate holding company construct, which is a kind of ring fencing construct. And so the way to think about ring fencing is basically that regulators say that it's no longer... So, so a global bank right, is, is, has, a, has a home country, and traditionally the main supervision was done in the home country, and say capital and liquidity could be distributed across the world in whatever way the bank judged, uh, judged most efficient, as long as on a consolidated basis it had enough capital and liquidity. And so the, the, the movement towards ring fencing is a movement where domestic regulators say, well, you have to have enough capital and liquidity even in each of the countries in which you operate. So say a European bank that has uh, a subsidiary in the U.S. has to capitalize and, uh, you know, the subsidiary in the U.S. Uh, on a standalone basis. And that, of course, has costs and benefits. So the benefit is in terms of financial stability for the host country, uh, but the cost is that it might distort capital and liquidity allocation across the larger banking organization. Um, you know, another, you know, and, and those are trade-offs. I mean, uh, you know, there are many trade-offs between financial stability and, say, credit growth. Uh, let me name uh, another, another trade-off like that. Um, at, the, at the fund, there has been a lot of work done on correspondent banking. Uh, so correspondent banking is basically uh, allowing uh, people around the world to wire uh, money uh, internationally. And you have to do that through correspondent banks. Uh, but correspondent banks have been uh, winding down their businesses in many foreign countries due to compliance concerns or regulatory concerns. Rob? Yeah, I, I basically agree with that. And then just tying it into, um, so I, I one time worked at a bank that proudly argue, uh, uh, announced that it was in over 100 countries. And this was an important call. They never, we never really had quite a great answer to the question that was asked on an investor call once. Why are you in 100 countries? Um, and so they're not in 100 countries now. But um, you know, obviously at the time, the argument was very much that there was a powerful economy from being everywhere your clients wanted to be, that there were economies of scale and scope, to being big and global. Uh, even though a lot of economists have failed to find in econometric work these economies, you know, to being this big. But there was that perception. And certainly, as you say, I mean, that's been challenged there because of the legal risks of misstepping in these global environments, the compliance risks, which Anders emphasized, as well as just a general economic reassessment that's gone on post the crisis. I don't see that necessarily coming back. But I also, as you see implied by my earlier remarks, see at least from that kind of these nationalistic pressures that I think are mounting in, in terms of the debate. Uh, yeah, a growing, that to the extent we see, whether it's in Europe, regulatory reforms that may create incentives for a homeward bias, I think you could get the same over the next several years in the US. The part of the way this debate resolves actually is maybe to reinforce a national bias uh, in, in bank uh, investment and the like. So I, I, I don't see that necessarily reversing. Yeah, I, I would just pipe in with that. I, I, I do think that there were elements of the reform agenda, Dodd-Frank and, and subsequent international efforts, that, that, that made that tension harder than it's in the past. But, you know, nothing compared to what Brexit is doing to the UK financial system. And, and you know, I, it's more that nationalist populist type of thing that is likely to create that tension. Uh, but, because, but, but, yeah. Jason, but there's a broader question here, and I think the second question it is. So we understand that there's a cost to ensuring financial stability, and we have to make a judgment about whether that cost is worth the benefit of heading off some future financial crisis. But in judging that cost, we, we are learning as we go as to what the costs are. So, for instance, 
there's some anomalies in pricing, covered interest parity, and there's co complaints about liquidity and stuff like that. So, Dan, you can answer whatever you want, but please, do you think there's a chance that we underestimated the costs of, of this financial regulation and now have to reevaluate? You can respond to that or the other question or say whatever you want. I mean, in, in general, there, there, we have to expect adjustments in the business models to, to the regulatory environment. And that's not per se bad, right? There will be <laughs> other new business decisions and so forth. For correspondent banking, I think the cost of correspondent banking has gone up due to compliance costs and so on. So <coughs> it's natural that some of the providers will leave that market. When it's a low margin business, costs go up. So a few will leave this market. For some countries, that's difficult because all of the providers have left. But for most countries, it's not, I don't think it's a, such a big issue because as long as you still have one or two providers in a country that, that is there, you don't need 10, right? Two, two, two is enough. But to I be honest, do you really think the really hard part of your question to answer, I would argue, David, is that I think on a, you know, this is hard to do because so much of the cost benefit analysis relies on a counterfactual of what might happen, and so it's anybody's game. And, you know, we did spend at the time that we were developing Dodd Frank a lot of um, work with the Fed to assess, you know, what is a point of capital requirement, you know, how do you trade that off in terms of GDP and in terms of future potential um, crises. And, you know, it's a guessing game if, if any of us are really honest uh, about that. Um, but I would argue that uh, the regulators, at least in the U.S., were very thoughtful about the cost benefit on most of the individual rules and regulations. Uh, what I do think is a fair question, which is even harder, as hard as that first one is, is what's the cumulative effect of all of these? And we didn't have the luxury, some of us tried, believe me, of kind of if we were to start with a blank sheet of paper, what might we do and you know, what would we get rid of in order to add the things we wanted to? And I think if you had that luxury, you would clean up a lot of things that on a cumulative basis would give you the same safety, if you like, with a lot less burden. That's just not the way the world works. And we have jurisdictions in Congress that oversee different parts of the system. We have, and you've got to work with what you have. And many of these were incremental to the existing infrastructure, um, which I think, as with healthcare, it's just the way it is. And, and maybe wiser, more enlightened people will move to a different mode in the future. I do think that's a, a, a harder question, but, but a valid question to say the cumulative effect of this may be overboard at the end of the day. Rahima, uh, there were two questions about China. One is, uh, are the banking regulators getting tougher on forcing them to accept that they have a lot of non-performing loans? And secondly, is there a risk of a demand shock, over-leveraged consumers pulling back? Do you have a view on either one of those? In terms of the, uh, the dynamics between uh, the banks and the, uh, the, the, the regulators, um, at what point they will begin to really force them? I think the presumption is that they're not doing that already. Uh, but it's going to be hard to know uh, when that occurs uh, because um, of the nature of uh, the way policies are operated. Uh, if there are some problems, usually they will be handled before it actually comes to the surface. So it's, uh, it's hard for anybody to be able to know exactly what may be going on underneath the surface. Uh, but going also the other way, I think um, there's been some uh, some evidence that uh, uh, regulators have recognized have like, exercised some regulatory forbearance, and that perhaps even the non-performing loan numbers that we're seeing uh, uh, do not fully reflect the true nature of the problem in the uh, in, in the banking system. Um, now, when it comes to the Chinese household and the demand shock, the area where uh, that is cause for concern actually is the, uh, the real estate sector. That's where a lot of uh, the, debt is, the debt is, and they've been struggling with it um, to sort of contain it. Um, I think part of it was uh, driven by demand with the increase of urbanization, uh, but there's also part of it that could have been uh, basically developers getting a, a sort of getting ahead. And so where the households may actually get that kind of uh, a wealth shock that may cause them to sort of pull back money from consumption would be basically the real estate sector. Uh, so the Chinese have also been fine-tuning policy to manage uh, 
uh, real estate prices. I think recently we've seen them go up quite a lot, but like around October of last year, they begin to deploy some prudential policies to try to gradually cause them to uh, exercise a soft lending and prevent precisely that outcome. Thank you. Take a few more. Uh, Peter, uh, two gentlemen here in the front. And, uh, Anna, the guy in the back, could you raise your hand again? Uh, the name is Judd here. Judd Harriet, uh, I'd like to draw you out a little bit more on the race to the bottom. What does this What does this mean for Dodd Frank? Sp specifically, what does it mean for the uh, derivative trading component of Dodd Frank? Okay, thank you. Can you pass the mic behind you? Um, hi, I'm Hunter Hamrick. I'm with National Journal, and I noticed like throughout this conversation, we've been talking about regulations. You know, specifically Dodd Frank. But one regulation that the administration has recently been doubling down on is um, Glass-Steagall. So I know like this is a really, it's going to be like a really broad question. But um, what do you guys think about like the administration's desire to bring back Glass-Steagall? Like, do you think it can improve financial stability? Do you think it's just going to actually unstabilize it, or do you think it's just it's pointless? We should just move on from that conversation. And Hi, I'm Barry Sterland uh, from Brookings. Um, two things that the emerging countries really are concerned about generally, particularly in Asian region, commodity exporters are a tightening of conditions from a, a combination of US policies, high dollar, uh, higher risk, higher premiums and risk premiums. And the second is a demand shock from China. Uh, one of the charts you put up, uh, Tobias, had a very stark suggestion that there could be an interaction between those two that's quite that in in a combination would be harmful the the big sensitivity of the chinese uh situation to u.s policies fragmentation protection and the like so i wouldn't mind uh, some comments from the panel about looking out for those interaction between some of those large shocks and how they could play through and whether there's some work in the fund to explore those interactions um uh, and, and it would be interesting comments. Thanks. Diana, do you want to take the Dodd-Frank questions? Uh, derivatives and Glass-Steagall. Um, yeah, well, um, look, I think that this whole question and your two couple of questions brings it precisely to light, uh, speaks to the deep uh, policy, po policy uncertainty that is you know, the current situation both in Congress and in the executive branch. Um, so who knows what's going to happen? My, my, my sense, as, and I would agree with you, Rob, that it, it's unlikely that there is going to be radical regulatory, uh, legislative changes on this. So um, the, the sort of, if, if you think about the energy that there was around uh, replace and repeal of the Health Care Act, even that hasn't gotten anywhere so far. And there's just not that same kind of energy anywhere for a broad repeal of Dodd-Frank. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't specific provisions that you know, are going to be very, very attractive to change, or maybe, and maybe should be changed or not, but we get back to the balancing act. So, um, so I, would, I would just comment on this, that I think what the most likely scenario is, is there are going to be some changes in the direction of relief for uh, the industry, some of which will probably be good, some of which may not be good. But I doubt that there's going to be a pretty radical, you know, rethinking Glass-Steagall or these sorts of things would be my best sense. Briefly, yeah, Rob. So just, yeah, Glass-Steagall, I don't know what it means, and I think it means different things to different people. But at the risk of oversimplification, it does seem to me there's two strong strands in the Congress. One is a focus on uh, and what you want to call a non-bailout criteria, right? Limiting the risk to taxpayer money from future crises, right? And that's very much a focus for them. And a lot of them fall behind these kind of notions of Glass-Steagall as a way of we're going to separate them and then we don't have to worry about we're protected. And then the other is this broader financial stability piece. And, and I think a lot of the rule setting may really actually focus on that, sort of that they can assure themselves that they are protecting taxpayer money, we can give the forbearance. I do think I don't know what it means for derivatives. I think the bigger risk in the near term is on capital and participation in these interna in, in international agreements. Orderly liquidation, where we saw an executive order recently, is another area 
where I do think there's a lot of pressure to do something and then the Volcker rule. All of these, though, are kind of trying to compartmentalize the desire to allow additional risk taking and forbearance. Right, but I would say that uh, even without major legislative changes, there will be different regulators enforcing each of these yeah. things, and there's a substantial amount of discretion, the Fed, the comptroller, and, and places. And it could take five years before we It'll really definitely know take we're five years. And I would really underscore that the game is not a legislative game. Right. It's to be a, do you want to? It could be pretty significant changes. To be a, can you deal with the China question, the interaction between the commodity prices and the demand shock from China and the exposure of other emerging markets yes, to course, China? Yeah. Um, of course, there's a tremendous amount of, of work at the fund on these broad questions uh, of, of particularly in the international transmission of shocks. Commodity right. prices are a key transmission mechanism for shocks and uh, uh, a mechanism that can give rise to contagion what we have seen in the in in the in the latest commodity cycle is that uh, there was a boom and then a bust in commodities uh, uh, around 2014 2015 and that was very much linked with uh, the the slowdown first the, the the sharp growth in China and then the slight slowdown of growth in China. So, um, so uh, why is that? Well, uh, China is a tremendous uh, consumer of commodities because it's producing uh, manufactured goods for the, for the whole world. And so the commodities are flowing into China and then manufactured goods are flowing out of China into the, into the world. And uh, so... Uh, the, the kind of growth rate that uh, the Chinese economy has is very much uh, a, a proxy for demand for commodities. But of course, it's not the only it's not the only area. Um, you know, demand for commodities from the U.S. advanced economies as well as other emerging market countries is also important. Uh, but so yes, I, I broadly agree that the nexus between commodities, uh, the business cycle, and, and the pricing of risk is, is very much at the heart of, of, uh, of considerations for financial stability that, uh, that are happening at the fund. Uh, thank you. I just want to respond with an unanswered question on the uh, amount of U.S. cash abroad. I think the short answer, as I understand it, is, of course, some of the foreign profits are actually invested in U.S. banks and in U.S. Treasury, so it's a bit of shorthand to say the money's overseas, but what the companies want is more flexibility on what to do with the money, and this repatriation would allow them at a lower tax rate to have full access to this money if they wanted to pay dividends or whatever. Um, with that, uh, please join me in thanking our panel and thanking all of you.